Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years, we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about us online at westminsterforum.org, and you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Michael Feinstein is an Emmy and Grammy-nominated musician who is widely recognized for his commitment to preserving the legacy of America's popular song. Growing up in Columbus, Ohio, he was playing the piano by ear at the tender age of five and mastering the music of the great American songbook. At age 20, he moved to Los Angeles and began working with the people who created the music he loved. In particular, the legendary lyricist Ira Gershwin. Today he brings the music of George and Ira Gershwin, Irving Berlin, Jerome Kern, Harry Warren, Duke Ellington, and more to audiences around the world. From Carnegie Hall to the Sydney Opera House to our very own Orchestra Hall across the street from Westminster. In addition to his extensive touring, he serves on the National Recording Preservation Board of the Library of Congress and is director of the Jazz and Popular Song Series for New York City's Jazz at Lincoln Center. He hosts the public radio program, Song Travels, and his PBS specials include the documentary series, Michael Feinstein's American Songbook. His new book, The Gershwins and Me, and the focus of tonight's presentation, is a tribute to the brothers who most influenced his life and career. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Michael Feinstein. It's my great pleasure to be here. It's lovely to share the experiences that uh, life has blessed me with uh, concerning music and its survival in these times. How often do you experience a moment in your life that you recognize as life-changing? One that is a crossroads that can lead you down a, a different path and permanently, permanently change the course of your trajectory. Well, that's what happened to me in July of 1977 when at the age of 20 I met Ira Gershwin. I never expected that I would meet a gentleman whom I idolized and people have asked me quite often, how did that happen? Well, that's a very interesting story and I think that's the best place for me to start to tell you how I came to meet Ira Gershwin and why at the age of 20 in an era of pop and rock would I have even wanted to meet Ira Gershwin? That immediately gives you a clue about me that I was a, uh, a lonely kid with no friends. <laughs> and that I always had uh, tastes that went uh, the opposite of my contemporaries of, of that time. But there was something about the music of the Gershwins and their contemporaries that attracted me at a very early age. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Hold the applause, please. <laughs> Thank you. And my parents are very musical and always encouraged me in all things having to do with music, even though they could not play instruments. My father could play a few things on the piano, but they just loved music, and music was always around in our house. And at the age of five, they had uh, saved enough money to be able to buy a new home, the first home that we could all live, my brother and sister and myself could have, it would be a, a new home. And we were all very excited about that. And when we moved in, we had this vast, empty living room. It seemed vast to me at the age of five. And my mother, of course, wanted to buy furniture. And my father said, no, let's buy a piano. And my mother said, well, why should we buy a piano? Nobody will ever play it. <laughs> and for some reason, my father earmarked me as the one who was going to play the piano. And they bought a piano. They got one for $500, which was on sale, a little spinet. And it was put in the corner of the living room. And about a week after it arrived, one day my father was at work. And uh, I wandered over to it. And I sat down and started playing with both hands. I started playing uh, Do Re Mi from The Sound of Music. 
And my, my mother immediately said, how did you learn to, to, to play that? Who taught you? And I said, nobody taught me. She said, well, that's not possible. <laughs> I said, well, I made it up. <laughs> and she said, don't tell a lie. You can't, you should lie. I said, I'm not lying. She sent me to my room for lying uh, until my father came home and then realized that I was playing by ear. And so I started playing the piano. And I could play full accompaniment at that age. And I started playing the songs that, that I heard around the house that uh, we watched on television shows like Sing Along with Mitch and The Lawrence Welk Show. And even then, at that age of five, I knew there was something odd about Lawrence Welk. <laughs> a strange guy. It, it, well, he was famous for saying things, reading cue cards, saying things like, and now a medley of songs from World of War, I, I. <laughs> this is no joke. Uh, another time, he, he was making another introduction, reading cue cards, and he said, now the Duke Ellington classic, Take a train. <laughs> but he played this music, and I got to learn and know and love this music. And finally, I discovered Gershwin. When I was a kid, somebody loaned me a record of Rhapsody in Blue. When I heard Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin, I had never heard anything so extraordinary in my young years. It, it created a feeling inside of me that literally changed my life. I had never had this sort of galvanizing experience with music that happened with Rhapsody in Blue. And suddenly, I had to find out about this man who created this music. Who, where did this come from? Was there more music like this? And so I started finding what I could uh, in the music of George Gershwin, and then I discovered the songs he had written with his older brother Ira. And it became a great mission for me to find as much as I could uh, written by the Gershwins and to find out about them and to find books about them. But in those times, long before the internet, it was not easy to find sheet music for the songs or find recordings, and so I was always doing what I could to gather what I could find. Well, eventually, my family moved to Los Angeles when I was 20 years old, and by that time, I had become as much of a Gershwin expert as was possible with the resources available to me, and I had discovered Oscar Levant. Oscar Levant was a close friend of George and Ira Gershwin's, and he was known as a concert pianist, as an actor, uh, as a wit, as a songwriter, and a close friend of George Gershwin's in particular. And after the death of George Gershwin, Oscar Levant became the greatest exponent of Gershwin music. And I had discovered Levant uh, when I saw the movie called Rhapsody in Blue, which is the film biography of George Gershwin. Turns out a lot of it was fictitious, but as a kid when I saw it, it was very exciting. Well, Oscar Levant was also famous for saying cheeky things about different people. When Eddie Fisher left Debbie Reynolds for Elizabeth Taylor, Oscar Levant said, how high can anyone stoop? <laughs> Being a friend of George Gershwin, Levant also uh, made Gershwin the, uh, the subject of some of his barbs, or the recipient, I should say. Uh, George Gershwin had a very, very healthy ego. And once Oscar said to him, tell me, George, if you had your life to live all over again, would you fall in love with yourself again? <laughs> and George Gershwin was known as a womanizer and had many girlfriends through the years. And someone said to Oscar, you know, George is with all those women because he's trying to prove he's a man. And Oscar said, what a great way to prove it. <laughs> in any event, it was through Oscar Levant's widow, June Levant, that I eventually met Ira Gershwin. June Levan is someone I had called up out of the blue after finding some records in a record store that had belonged to her husband. And she saw something in me that she thought would interest Ira and his wife, Leonor Gershwin. And they asked to meet me. So there I was at the age of 20, suddenly in the home of a gentleman who was my, my idol. And um, I was very nervous and trying to make some sort of conversation with Ira, trying to find something to say that wouldn't make me sound like a, like a fool. Uh, and uh, I said, Mr. Gershwin, I have an old 78 record of gems from La La Lucille, which was George Gershwin's first Broadway musical produced in 1919. And Ira said, oh, well that must be the two most popular songs from, from the show, T. Odal Umbumbo and Nobody But You. And I said, that's right. And Lee Gershwin, who was sitting there with her sister Emily, who was visiting, said, isn't that cute? He's telling Ira that's right. 
Well, they hired me to catalog their collection of phonograph records, and it was the kind of job that I would have paid them to do. And there I was, coming in to Beverly Hills every day, sitting at the feet of the master, uh, cataloging these records and listening to Ira tell stories and anecdotes about his life and his work. And one day, I was whistling absentmindedly a verse of one of his obscure songs, and he was reading the New York Times, and, and uh, as I was whistling, he suddenly stopped and he turned around in his chair, because I was sitting behind him, and he said, Mike, that's the verse of Beginner's Luck. I wrote that with George in 1936 for Shall We Dance? And I said, I know. <laughs> he said, well, how, how do you know? I said, well, I know a lot about your work. And he started quizzing me, asking me questions about this and that. And he realized that I was this very knowledgeable kid at the age of 20 about his work, and he was perplexed by it. And he looked at me and he said, how many more like you are there? <laughs> well, at that point, I told him I played the piano and I sat down and played for him, which would have gone better if he hadn't told me right before I struck the first chord that that was the piano on which George had composed most of Porgy and Bess. <laughs> because then my fingers sort of, sort of did, you know, atrophy, but nonetheless I did play and, and we evolved a relationship that was very special to me. I became sort of the son or the grandson that he never had. And I was someone who had brought some sort of life back into his world. Ira was very depressed at that time because he had lost several friends. He was 80 at that time and I was 20, so he uh, was experiencing the loss of many people. And he came back to life. And his wife, Lee, came to me one day and said, I need to talk to you. And I thought, uh-oh. Because Lee was kind of a tough lady, uh, a heart of gold inside, but it was sometimes hard to get there. And she said, you've given my husband a new le lease on life. And I want you to know that your being here is very important for him and to me. And she said, I'm going to open up every closet and drawer so you can find every kind of memorabilia or papers or whatever it is that will keep you busy. So please... Stay here as long as you can, and most importantly, keep my husband occupied. So for six years, that was my job, to, to keep Ira happy, to keep him present in the world, to always find some piece of music or a recording or something that would uh, uh, keep him engaged. And in the process, of course, I learned more than I ever could have dreamt of knowing about the world of the Gershwins, about George Gershwin's life, about Ira's process of writing songs, about their contemporaries, life lessons, things that uh, were truly my college education. And because of that, I'll never be able to properly repay Ira for what he did for me, and to repay Leonor and June Levant. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try and preserve many of the stories and anecdotes that were handed down to me that otherwise might not exist, might not survive. Because Ira taught me so much about interpreting the songs, I also decided to include a CD with the book because it's one thing to write about the songs, but of course it's most important to be able to hear them. And so, with that said, I'm going to move to the piano. <laughs> one of the things that was very interesting for me was learning about the process of how many of these songs were created, because the creative process of writing a piece of music is very mysterious, and the inspiration can come from anywhere. I believe it's divine. I think a lot of it comes from a spiritual source. But the nuts and bolts of achieving the final product of a song is sometimes a very circuitous path. And accidents happen that, in ret retrospect, are very happy accidents. And an example of that is how George and Ira came to write one of the most famous ballads. In 1926, they were working on a Broadway musical called OK. It's a show that starred the great British musical theater performer Gertrude Lawrence. And they had to come up with a ballad that she could sing in a rather plaintive and small voice. And yet, this particular day, George and Ira were working on the dance number for the show. And George played a melody that went like this. That's the melody he'd come up with, and the idea was that it had this syncopation. But as he was playing it, he was distracted by his sister Frances, 
who asked him a question and he slowed down. And as he slowed down, Ira's ears perked up and he said, George, play that again slow. And he played. And that's how they came to write this song that was always particularly important to Ira because Ira wrote these words just around the time he married his wife, Leonor. And he later confessed to me that one line in the song he wrote about himself, he may not be the man some girls think of as handsome. So this is for, for Ira and Lee. There's a saying, Lord, says that love is blind. Still we're often told, seek and ye shall find. So I'm going to seek a certain girl I've had in mind. Looking everywhere, haven't found her yet. She's the big affair I cannot forget. Only girl I ever think of with regret. I'd like to add my initial to her monogram. Tell me where is the shepherd for this lost lamb? There's a somebody I'm longing to see I hope that she turns out to be Someone who will watch over me I'm a little lamb that's lost in the wood I know I could always be good to one who will watch over me. Although I may not be the man some girls think of as handsome, to her heart I'll carry the key. Won't you tell her please to put on some speed? Follow my lead, oh, how I need someone to watch over me. She may be far, she may be nearby, I'm promising hereby, to my heart she'll care. some of you who don't know anything about George Gershwin, and it's hard to put George Gershwin in perspective in these times because there's no one with whom he can be compared in the musical world. George Gershwin was born in Brooklyn, New York, September 26, 1898, at 242 Snedeker Avenue, and his family were Russian Jewish immigrants. They had come from St. Petersburg, 
Morris and Rose Gershwin. They were married in 1895 in New York. Their first child was Ira, who was born in 1896. Then came George. Then their brother Arthur in 1900, and their sister Frances in 1906. And uh, the Gershwins were um, people who um, were not particularly musical. Morris Gershwin was always trying to get involved in different businesses and always seemed to fail, yet Ira recalled that they lived uh, very middle class. But he also remembered that they lived two dozen different places during their formative years. And George Gershwin was a rough and tumble kid of the streets of New York who uh, uh, was very macho and uh, uh, had no interest particularly in music. But one day at a school assembly, he heard a violinist named uh, Max Rosen. And uh, Max played the uh, Dvorak, humoresque, on the violin. And George was so captivated by the piece of music that he chased Max after the assembly and said, I, I want to know more about music. And Max started teaching him about music, and then George found a, an old upright piano at the home of a friend and started playing it. And then he started playing piano for the school assembly, and all of a sudden he was playing the piano and started to exhibit this extraordinary uh, talent for it. And Ira was the first person in the Gershwin family to recognize that George had talent. And he was so shocked by what his brother could do that Ira recognized in those early years that his brother was going to turn out to be somebody who would one day be world famous. Ira was absolutely convinced of it. And George was a guy who by the time he was 20 years old wrote a song hit called Swanee that sold millions and millions of copies and he was pursuing a career as a professional musician, largely self-taught. He took piano lessons here and there, but he exhibited this extraordinary talent that was, that was amazing. Now, in 1920, there was an interview with George Gershwin right after Swanee became a success, and he was asked what his ambitions were. He said that he hoped one day to write serious concert works with an American theme. He felt that the most organic roots of American music came from African Americans, even though in that article he referred to them as the music of the darkies, which was uh, the term that I guess was in use at that time, even though George did not have a prejudiced or racist bone in his body. In any event, in 1920, he basically set out in this interview to accomplish everything that he did over the next uh, 17 years of his life. Well, by 1924, George Gershwin wrote a piece called Rhapsody in Blue. It was a piece of special material. The Paul Whiteman Orchestra commissioned it from George. Actually, Paul Whiteman gave an interview in which he said he was doing this concert and George Gershwin was going to write a concert piece. Well, by 1924, Gershwin was very well, well known as a songwriter but he hadn't written anything like Rhapsody in Blue. And Gershwin called Paul Whiteman and said, what are you talking about? And Whiteman said, well, we've talked about you writing something for us. He said, why don't you do it? And George said, well, okay, I'll try. Well, he did. He wrote Rhapsody in Blue. And after the Rhapsody in Blue was premiered at Aeolian Hall in February of 1924, there was pandemonium. And suddenly, Gershwin was getting all this attention. And George went to Ira and said, they're going to publish Rhapsody in Blue. And Ira said, well, who in the world would buy that? <laughs> well, it was a piece written for the Whiteman Orchestra, and it was 15 minutes long. Why would somebody buy it? But it turns out that by June of 1924, Whiteman made a recording of Rhapsody in Blue with George at the piano, and suddenly this piece caught on like wildfire, and it was being performed all over America, and then it went all around the world. And George Gershwin, in a few short years, became the most famous American composer and songwriter in the world. Then he wrote the Concerto in F in 1925. He wrote a tone poem called An American in Paris in 1928. And during this time, he was writing musical comedies with Ira, who had become a lyricist, and Ira was supplying the words for all of these musicals, and it, it was an amazing combination in that Ira had this wonderful aptitude for writing clever and unusual ways of expressing love, and combined with George's melodies, they were writing songs, the likes of which the musical theater world had never heard before. And so here were these two geniuses changing the face of American music and George constantly stretching his own uh, limitations by getting whatever education he could. And they were just doing what they did. George loved music and was creating as the muse struck him and Ira was writing these songs and neither of them ever suspected that these works would endure and in the period that I spent time with Ira, he would often say, 
I can't believe that all these songs I wrote so long ago are actually still of interest to anybody. He couldn't believe it, because they were written for commerce. They were written for plot situations. And so the Gershwin legend grew and grew, so much so that Oscar Levant said, even the lies about George Gershwin are being distorted. <laughs> There was nobody like George Gershwin. And in 1934, he decided he was going to write an American opera. Well, imagine the chutzpah of this guy. That's Italian, by the way. Uh, <laughs> imagine the nerve of this guy wanting to write an opera at that time when, when there were many famous American composers who had written operas. But George had a specific vision in mind. He saw the novel, read the novel, Porgy by DeVos Hayward and thought that was the best source material for an opera. Well, immediately everybody started to uh, criticize him. The African-American community said, who does this man think he is trying to write music about our people? The Jewish community said he's in over his head. His Tin Pan Alley cronies were jealous. He wanted it produced at the Metropolitan Opera, but they would not produce it with an all-black cast. George insisted that this was an opera for uh, African-Americans, and he wanted it done by an authentic black cast. And the Met said, we don't have enough African-American opera singers. We can't do this, and we don't think that it'll draw. And they wanted to do it in blackface. And George said, no, thank you. And he went on and on until he found a company that would produce it, the Theater Guild, which was not the most flush organization. But they wanted to do it. And they agreed to an all-black cast, and it ended up being produced on Broadway. Well, through that two-year period that he was working on Porgy and Bess, he never wavered in his belief in his work. And yet, when the piece opened, it was a financial failure. It received a great deal of criticism, even though the, the reviews were more positive than negative. But it was clear that in the eyes of most people, it was a misfire. But George Gershwin never wavered in his belief that after his passing, it would become a work for which he would be long remembered. He was that kind of guy. He had an incredible ego, and yet he was very generous with his contemporaries. Now, it was Harold Arlen who spoke about George's generosity, but also about how he could be very egocentric. Uh, once when George was in a taxi cab and the man was driving recklessly, he said, careful man, you've got Gershwin in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and his uh, sister-in-law, Emily Paley, went to visit him one day with her friend Mabel, and they got all done up in their finery to have lunch with him, and George answered the door in a very dandy new suit and said, well, girls, how do I look? <laughs> once George was at a party, and uh, it was always very important uh, to try and get George Gershwin to play the piano at your party because then you knew that you had made the society columns. And of course, he loved playing the piano and he always liked to play the selections from his newest shows that were about to be produced. And so George S. Kaufman said that by the time the shows opened on Broadway, they felt like revivals. <laughs> but nonetheless, one day George was, was uh, at this party and this beautiful showgirl was seated on his on his lap, and the hostess asked him to play the piano, and he got up so quickly he knocked the girl to the ground. <laughs> so there was this man with this, uh, this great ego, but it was charming to everybody because he absolutely uh, had no false modesty. If you were to say to George Gershwin, George, I think Porgy and Bess is wonderful, he would say, thank you, I think it is too. <laughs> and he was just honest about his own assessment of his work. And Ira was quite the opposite. Ira was such a wallflower, and he was very shy and quiet, and you'd never know that he was at a party. And he was embarrassed if you paid him a compliment. Ira once told me something that I find extraordinary. He was swimming when he was uh, in his teens in the East River, and uh, there was a lifeguard on duty, and lots of other people were, were in the water. And Ira waded in, and he got out uh, a little bit far, and he started to drown. And he was actually going under, and the lifeguard spotted him and pulled him out of the water, and he passed out, and by the time he came to again, the lifeguard was gone. And I said, well, when you knew that you were drowning, did you, did you cry for help or anything? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, I was too embarrassed. <laughs> Can you imagine? I said, well, what would have happened if the lifeguard hadn't seen you? He said, I probably would have drowned. That's the difference between these two guys. Now, many years after George Gershwin's passing, Rose Gershwin, in 1948, right before her own uh, passing, was asked how it felt to be the mother of these two geniuses. And she said, you know, if I had it to do all over again, I never would have had children. 
<laughs> Trying to figure that one out. Well, George Gershwin died July 11, 1937, at the age of 38. He had a brain tumor, and by the time they discovered what was wrong with him, it was too late to do anything that might have saved him. People were so shocked that the great George Gershwin had passed that it seemed like a cruel joke. And Ira had been working with George up to the very end. And they were working on a song that Ira had to finish after George's passing. And with George's death, Ira was so devastated, so overcome with grief that he retreated into his own world and he could not uh, uh, express himself. He was simply lost. And then there came a call from the studio asking Ira to finish this song he had been working on with George. And even though Ira did not want to have to finish it, he didn't feel it could work. It turned out that the process of setting pen to paper enabled him to release all these pent-up thoughts and feelings. And I feel this song is very much Ira's personal comment about George. And I'd like to sing it for you now. The more I read the papers, the less I comprehend the world and all its capers and how it all will end. Nothing seems to be lasting, but that isn't our affair. We've got something permanent, I mean in the way. We care. It's very clear. Our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and a day. The radio and the telephone. And the movies that we know may just be passing fancies and in time may go. But oh my dear, our love is here to stay. Together we going along. Gibraltar may tumble, they're only made of clay, but our love is here, our love is here, our love is here to stay, to stay. I'll do one more. I think that'll probably be uh, ample, uh, ample time uh, for this segment. Uh, to show you how very much a part of the fabric of our lives the Gershwin Songbook is, uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, who many years ago were collaborating on a project, and Carl had to go to the doctor. And when he came back from the doctor, Mel said, what did the doctor say? And Carl said, well, the doctor said, I've got arrhythmia. And Mel said, who could ask for anything more? <laughs> Well, as much as these songs are part of the lives of so many of us, we do have generations that don't know the name Gershwin, and that's one of the reasons I created the book, for people who might not know anything about them. 
A friend of mine is a voice teacher, and she said one of her students got up one day and said, I'm going to sing Summertime by Porgy and Bess. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're at. So that's why I really wanted to do this book. One of the things that I included in the book are uh, many beautiful illustrations. I guess you could say it's a coffee table book as much as there is a great deal of text. And uh, there are reproductions of many of George Gershwin's manuscripts, which I think are interesting for people to see. So you can see in his handwriting how, how facile he was in um, setting down uh, all of this, this music. And here's a song that I think is facile both musically and lyrically, and I think it's an appropriate way with which to tie this all up because it certainly describes the way that I feel. It's wonderful, it's marvelous, you should care for me. It's awful nice, it's paradise, it's what I long to see. You've made my life so glamorous, you can't blame me for feeling That you should care for me. It's wonderful, it's marvelous. You should care for me. Sell a god, it's what I want, it's what I need to see. Thank you, Michael Feinstein. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. It reminds me of the forum we did with, what, David Brooks or David Gergen? Or... <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> and it's pretty nice. In fact, sitting here, I thought, oh yeah, it's the forum. I got to get up and speak. <laughs> so we're broadcasting from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson. Senior Minister here at Westminster Presbyterian, moderator of the forum, our speaker and singer and guest tonight is Michael Feinstein. The ushers are collecting questions from the in-house audience. I want to remind you that our next forum is in one week, Thursday, November 1st, again in the evening at 7 p.m., when author and social justice advocate Sister Joan Chittister will discuss the new violence and its unexpected victims. And now, Mr. Feinstein, if you would return to the microphone, I will present questions from our audience. 
First one has to do with the nature of the music that you're formed by and that you love so much, the Gershwin's The Great American Songbook, and how much do you think that music reflects the American character, and in what ways? How it reflects the American character and in what ways? Irving Berlin once said, history makes music and music makes history. I think that all music reflects the time in which it is created. I think one of the reasons that the music of the Gershwins and Irving Berlin, Rogers and Hart, Colt Porter, and all those writers of what we call the Great American Songbook lasts because there is something in that period that was sort of comparable to the Italian Renaissance for art, and yet the values and the emotions and the craft of those songs still relate to us today. They are still contemporary in their sensibility, and that's why I think they will live. And also, I think that they do reflect the best of what America is about, because many of these writers were Jewish immigrants who came from uh, many different places, and it was the melting pot of America that was the creative juice and inspiration for this work. And because of that, I think that these songs are not only uh, the most typically American, but I think that they have been our goodwill ambassadors and have represented us very well throughout the world for many, many years. How are these songs received, the Great American Songbook, the Gershwins, and other parts of the world? They are rapturously received in most places. For example, when Alexander's Ragtime Band was popular in the United States in 1911 and 1912, it was also the number one song in England. It was the number one song in Australia. And in foreign-speaking countries, that song was just as popular there. And uh, when I travel all over the world, it is the most extraordinary thing because people want to hear these songs and they know the words even often when they don't speak English. You embrace this music as a young man, as you've described. Are young people today similarly enthralled with this music? There are some young people who are outcasts, like who, were out, who are outcasts as I was as a kid, who have embraced this music. I say outcasts because it is not the music that's played on the radio or uh, over, the, over the internet, uh, generally speaking. It's not the most popular uh, music. However, uh, I created an organization called the Feinstein Initiative, and every year we have a high school competition with high school kids, thousands of them entering from all over, applying to regionals all over the country. And so there are thousands and thousands of kids that care about the Great American Songbook. And that's because they can find it now on the internet. You can look up and find anything on the internet, and therefore they can discover Ethel Waters or Billie Holiday or George Gershwin or Russ Colombo or whoever. They're out there to be found, and so there are many, many young people that are interested. I don't think that it'll ever replace pop music as we know it now, but I think there will always be a place for it, and I think that there will always be young people that will gravitate towards it. Are there new songs being added to the Great American Songbook? There are. There are new songs being added to the Great American Songbook. However, we won't know what they are for 20 years or so, because to me what denotes uh, being part of the Great American Songbook is the fact that it lasts. These songs have lasted for decades and decades because they are constantly being reinvented, they are being re-recorded and sung by new generations. Whether songs performed by Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber will be heard in 20 years, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. The thing is that these songs written in the 20s and 30s and 40s and such were recorded by many, many different people. I think that is the hallmark of what makes a song last. So, it's only time that will tell. Most of the names in the Great American Songbook are men. How has the female voice shaped the genre? One of the great um, types of songs that came out of the Great American Songbook's golden age is the torch song, generally considered to be politically correct these days because it's always about a woman pining for a man or the man has left her or the man has done wrong. It's, it's rare that it was the other way around, I guess because most of the songs are written by men. Uh, but uh, Desperate men, apparently. Desperate, yes, that's true. Well, when you think about the fact that these songwriters were writing all these romantic songs and they often didn't have the most happy domestic lives, like Frank Lesser, after he divorced his first wife, always referred to her thereafter as the evil of two lessers. <laughs> But in answer to your question, I think that um, the performances of these songs by, uh, by women has been uh, 
uh, obviously very important. Uh, and it's interesting to note in the early days of recording, it was illegal to change the gender of a lyric. And so you will find all these odd recordings of things like The Man I Love sung by men because most of the vocalists with bands in those days were men. And it wasn't until uh, women started singing these songs that many of these uh, songs became standards. How would you define the term Great American Songbook? What time period does it cover? Who's included? And maybe who's missing? It's a difficult question to answer because I don't think that there are specific boundaries of the time of the Great American Songbook for one reason that I just mentioned a moment ago, that I think it is ever evolving. I think also that as times change, we can look at other uh, pieces of music as being part of the Great American Songbook. And the Great American Songbook is mainly music that has come from Broadway and Hollywood uh, in the Golden Age. And when I say the Golden Age, I'd say the, the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. But it does go further back, and it does move way past that. But those songs are connected to uh, what we now call country western, used to be called hillbilly, and to race music, and to blues, and to jazz, and to all the other forms. It is all interrelated. So if my back is pressed to the wall, I would describe the essential Great American Songbook as being from the teens through the 1940s. But of course that's leaving out so many others. But it includes Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, George Gershwin, uh, Duke Ellington, and, and uh, many of the, the giants. As far as what is excluded, uh, I find that perhaps um, Lead Belly is not considered to be part of the Great American Songbook, generally speaking, but I, I, for me, he is. For me, Woody Guthrie is part of the Great American Songbook. This land is your land. I mean, they're all part of it, and I think that the, the term is ever-expanding for that reason. How much do you think George Gershwin's music, his style and, and inspiration were influenced by uh, the American phenomenon known as ragtime that immediately preceded jazz? George Gershwin was very influenced by ragtime. He wrote a rag. His third published piece was called Rialto Ripples, written in collaboration with a man named Will Donaldson. But Donaldson's collaboration is uh, suspect what he contributed to it. But uh, one of uh, George Gershwin's pieces of ju juvenilia was called Raggin' the Traumerai. So he was very influenced by rag, uh, ragtime and uh, wrote about going to hear rag pianists, ragtime pianists, and uh, stride pianists of uh, the teens. He'd go to Coney Island to hear uh, a particular guy play the piano, and he would go to Harlem. He would go all over the place. So the short answer is that he was very influenced by ragtime, and he helped to evolve uh, the form and, and uh, move past ragtime, but he started uh, in that era in writing that kind of music. How can we keep the music of the Great American Songbook, those of us who are here tonight and listening on the radio, how can we keep that music from fading into obscurity? by my book. <laughs> that's, that's what we call a softball question. And you hit it. <laughs> and there is a CD included with the book. I think I mentioned that. Earlier. Well, how do we keep it alive? It, 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 the this music is kept alive by, by one person passing it on to the next. Uh, when I meet these young people that love the Great American Songbook, it's because their parents or someone in their family or extended family has exposed them to it. And I think that in spite of the fact that the internet offers infinite possibilities, unless somebody is there to lead the kids to it, it, it uh, might not reach them. I think one of the great problems in our world today is that the deprivation of arts funding and the deprivation of culture has created the climate and society in which we live, which has created a political divide the likes of which none of us have ever seen. And that is very clear, clearly to me because we have lost the common ground of the arts to give us something in which we can share and look at another human being with whom we may have differences and look at the common things that bond us together. I think it's absolutely terrible that uh, we don't have any, it seems that anybody in the political system who is fighting to keep the arts alive, forget about parties, just in general, there's nobody that is championing the arts in a way that is desperately needed to preserve the, the fabric of the country.
you've arrived at a time in Minnesota when we're distracted by lots of different things uh, related to politics. Uh, you raised politics, so I, I was going to ignore these questions, but let's get at it. <laughs> there, there are several questions that have come forward about uh, whether you would comment on the, the amendment to the Minnesota Constitution that is before the people of this state that would define marriage as between one man and one woman. Well, some people may know that uh, I married my partner, uh, Terrence Flannery, four years ago in California. We were married by a wonderful Episcopal, Episcopal Pete. Uh, well, maybe we can edit that, I don't know. He might have been, might have been Presbyterian for all we know. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, this is the most wonderful uh, all-embracing congregation, and it's, uh, it's very special to me to be here. Uh, Gabriel Ferrer is an Episcopal priest who married Terrence and myself, and uh, he shared the, uh, the duties with uh, Judge Judy, Judge Judy Scheinler, uh, because she wanted to make a statement that she was in favor of anybody being able to marry. Uh, my personal feeling is that uh, everybody is entitled to uh, their opinion, and uh, this is America, where we have the great freedom to, to uh, believe and do as we wish. And therefore, I wish that also that uh, people who wish to get married could uh, have the right to do so without the interference of others. It's very simple. How important it is, is it to you to be true to the tune as written, the tempo, the dynamics, the phrasing as it appears they intended each, when each piece was written by the Gershwins? versus rendering the particular piece in your own way, in your own version, your own interpretation? I believe that a song is kept alive by way of the different interpretations that it receives. And having spent time with a lot of songwriters, uh, Ira Gershwin being the first, and Harry Warren, and Condon and Green, and Burton Lane, and Jerry Herman, and Bernstein, and Sondheim, and so many others, the one thing I discovered is that these writers don't mind liberties being taken with the works if they feel that those liberties will enhance what they've created. Uh, even Richard Rogers, who is legendary for having insisted that his songs be performed exactly as he wrote them, only felt that way in the theater. With popular recordings, he was much more liberal. And I think that it is essential to be able to take certain liberties with the songs because they keep them alive. But I think it really is a matter of taste. I, I don't like it where people will sometimes change the lyrics, where it will change the meaning of the song. And as much as I revere Frank Sinatra and recorded two CDs in tribute to him, uh, I don't like the way he later changed some of the lyrics, simply because it wasn't what the writers intended. And so it is a slippery slope, but I think that the songs have to be uh, reinterpreted. Even though certain pieces, like Summertime, Summertime is a piece that I think is so perfectly set in the Op Corgi and Best, the orchestration that George Gershwin wrote, and this incredible harmonic ostinato that goes back and forth. That is so perfect that, for me, that's the only way I truly like hearing it. Even though I like Janis Joplin's version of it, and I like many others, but, but for me, that is, it doesn't get better than that. You want to demonstrate for us? <laughs> I don't think I can channel my inner Janis Joplin. But, uh, but I can give you a demonstration of, of how a song changes, how a song evolves. The song, I've Got a Crush on You, was written as an up-tempo piece. This is how George and Ira Gershwin wrote it. That's how they wrote it. Now, after George died, it was recorded for the first time. It had never been recorded by Lee Wiley, who did it as a ballad. And Frank Sinatra heard that particular recording, and he decided to record it in 1948, 20 years after it was written. And those 20 years later, Sinatra sang it as a very languid, beautiful, romantic thing. And when Ira Gershwin heard that recording, he was so perplexed and thwarted because he wrote those words to be sung fast. I've got a crush on you, sweetie pie. And when he heard them slow, at first he didn't like it. And then he realized that interpretively, the song worked much better as a ballad. And it also became one of the most popular songs that he ever wrote, 20 years after he had given up on it, as sung like this. I've got a crush on you, 
Sweetie pie, all the day and night time, hear me sigh. The world will pardon my mush, cause I've got a crush, my baby, on you. Thank you for that little impromptu piece. You're welcome. The younger years of your life were influenced by the Gershwins, and you described that. Surely you haven't stopped being influenced. Who's influencing your music today? There are um, many influences in the world, and one of the things I love about being alive today is that we have everything that came before. Uh, we live in a time uh, in which the last hundred years spawned technology that makes it possible to experience um, so much that uh, has been preserved. With uh, today's artists, uh, there are certain singers I enjoy listening to. Uh, Catherine Russell, I think, is a, is a wonderful vocalist. Rebecca Kilgore. There's a young singer-songwriter, Eric Hutchinson, who uh, writes in the style of the great American songbook. Uh, but also is a very, uh, very great pop writer. In other words, he's, he looks at the traditions but writes music that's popular today. Uh, there's a, an amazing uh, ukulele virtuoso, Jake Shimabukuro, who uh, is he's fantastic. He's taken this four-string instrument and turned it into uh, a, a, a means by which he performs this virtuoso music. And it just continues to show me how the simplest instruments and the simplest uh, pieces of music can be reinvented, reinterpreted, and there are always things to be uh, discovered. I don't listen to a lot of pop music on the airwaves. I rely on the kindness of my friends to point me to particular artists because we all have information overload now, and it's impossible to cover everything. But um, I meditate every day, and I always say a prayer that what is supposed to reach me will reach me, and that I'll always continue to evolve and stay fresh in what I do. One final question. Uh, music does something to us and for us and with us as a people and as individuals. Uh, can you speak about where you find hope or positive sense of the future in the music you play and listen to and love? There is no question to me that music is healing, music is divine, music is spiritual, and music gives hope. I have seen music physically heal people in that I've played in convalescent homes and in the Alzheimer's wards of different facilities where people literally wake up who have been disconnected and you can see this extraordinary uh, clip of a man on the internet uh, who uh, demonstrates that. This, this uh, clip has gotten millions of hits. This guy who was basically non-communicative was given music to listen to by uh, headphones and literally came back and started talking and conversing and was reconnected. Music, I think, is one of the greatest gifts we have in our world because it changes the state of mind. It opens up the possibility of achievement in life. It connects us to other people. And I think it is one of the things that can save us in a time where there appears to be uh, very little else that can possibly be of salvation. I think it is extraordinarily important to keep music in our lives in whatever way we can and to share it and also to keep music as a communal experience. Because the solitary experience of listening to music is not the way most music was listened to for most of uh, time. And to have gatherings where people communally share and make music together and listen to music, to listen to a choir in church, gives us a communal experience that, with the power of numbers, gives us the hope that we can go out and make the world a better place. Thank you, Michael Feinstein. Thank you very much.